Welcome, Dan. <laughs> Welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah, great. Great to have you. Uh, excited about today's presentation. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to introduce Dan Dan Taravist, a uh, doctor. I believe it is Dan Taravist, uh, partner of our side. Um, many here probably have seen, heard of Greg uh, Ostick, and Dan is a. <laughs> Anything that's, that we uh, attribute to Greg, Dan has been uh, complicit in. Uh, they're partners in, in our side. He's a, a silent, <laughs> prefers prefers behind the scenes, I think it's fair to say. Um, but really looking forward to his presentation today with a lot of the uh, updates and details and um, conclusions of our 2020 um, data collection. So um, yeah, I think we can just let you take it away, but uh, looking forward to looking forward to the presentation. All right. Thank you, Dan. All right. Let me bring it up here a minute. There we go. All right. Yeah. So um, I am excited to be here today. As Dan said, I'm usually in the background, but this conversation is, is more my speed. I get a nerd out on data and, and not talk so much about the other stuff, the big picture stuff, which isn't my strength. Um, so I want to talk today a lot about um, what causes variation in quality? And, and we're really gonna do a deep dive into the, the 2020 data set. So first, let me give you uh, a information about me. As I mentioned, I am co-founder of RSI LLC. Greg Ostick is my partner. I'm also a soil scientist. I did my PhD research working on conservation agriculture systems in Malawi in Southern Africa, uh, mostly working with smallholder farmers to, to find methods to reduce tillage, uh, increase crop diversity in the hopes that we could improve soil health and productivity. Um, before starting RSI, I worked at on the Photosync project at Michigan State University for three years, where I helped research projects uh, with various research partners across the US, Africa, and South America. And I often serve as kind of a bridge between development groups, software programmers and such, and user experience. So I spend a lot of my time kind of coordinating uh, technical groups on one hand, and then people who are actually gonna use the tools that we develop on the other. So the purpose of today, you heard Dan say this in previous meetings, right? There's four key goals um, of the Bionutrient Institute that have been consistent um, throughout the last three or four years. Those are to you know, determine the amount of variation in nutrition and food, relate soil health and nutrient density outcomes to crop and management practices, uh, predict nutritional outcomes in produce using spectral data and other data forms, and then build a public library of crop nutrition and soil and crop management. So today, I'm going to talk about three of those. So Greg is going to be giving a talk that is all about uh, prediction on August 19th. So that's a little teaser. If you want to hear really about how we made the bionutrient meter, you know, make estimates, that's going to be the topic. So please check in again at the SNC conference in a month. So for today, Determining variation starts with where we find that variation. So the sources of the 2020 data that we're going to be talking about throughout this meeting. Um, these are all of the partners who helped us share data this year. So we have, you know, partners, farmers, citizen scientists all over the US and Europe who submitted samples to our main lab in Ann Arbor, uh, to our sister labs in Chico State in California, to the lab in France. Um, all told, you can see on the right, this is a table of all of the crops we received samples for and the number of samples we received. So everything from you know 36 blueberries to almost 500 oats and potato samples um, for a total of like 3,800 samples that we analyzed throughout the year 2020. Those samples that came in, we analyzed the food samples for antioxidants, polyphenols, uh, protein and grains, and then 15 minerals. I'm not gonna read them all here, but this set of 15 minerals and bricks. And then when we received soils from farms, they often came with associated soil samples, usually with zero to four and four to eight inch depths. Those samples we analyzed for organic carbon, respiration, pH, and minerals. So this is the data set that we're working with to talk about today. I just wanna make one point 
all of the, the data, polyphenols, all this, this was all generated using laboratory techniques. So while you can use the bionutrient meter to make estimates of things, these are not bionutrient meter estimates, they are actual lab quantified values. And so here is a range plot for the variation of just calcium. So we have like 18 things that we're measuring. This is just calcium. And I want to take you kind of through this a minute, explain it. So let's, if everyone kind of pays attention to this Swiss shard plot, this is the range. So the minimum to the maximum of calcium content in every Swiss shard leaf that came into the, any one of those three labs. Oops. Sorry. Um, these, this mean, this circle, this is the mean, which is just the average of all the samples that we received in the lab. This triangle is the median. The median is another way of estimating an average. Um, for people who aren't familiar, it's just you kind of sort from highest to lowest, and it's the point that's exactly in the middle. Um, that sometimes can be a more accurate way of estimating an average. And then this blue um, square here, that is the data that is in the USDA Food Data Central database. And you can see the website here, that's where those, that data came from. So when we look at this, now that we kind of got our, our uh, orientation, we look at this graph, we see that there are a ton of variation in calcium across all of these crops. And if we were to say, look at this, the, the kale, for example, if we had took one leaf of kale from up here and we compared it to, to the leaves here, it would have six times as much calcium as these low calcium leaves. Or another way to say it is, if someone like me who doesn't actually like to eat kale that much was looking for kale to eat, I would much rather eat one of these leaves than six of these. So I want this one. I just want to eat one leaf. I wanted to show this, and we're not going to dive into this graph. I know there's a lot here. Um, I wanted to show just a handful of the other things that we measure in the lab, just to give you a sense that this level of variation we're seeing in calcium, we're seeing across the board in every nutrient, every mineral that, that we are, are analyzing in our lab. So I, I don't want anybody to think I cherry picked calcium because it was the, it had the most variation. So it made for a cute story. Like, no, this is what we see across the board with everything we're measuring. You know, there is a lot of variation. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my, my, my original plot here, which is a little easier to look at. Um, if there are some scientists on, on the call or statisticians, they might argue that, oh yeah, this range of kale is really big, but I bet most of the kale is all bunched up right around here. See, we've got the, the USDA mean, which is really close to our averages, which by itself is a really nice quality check for us that, hey, what we're doing is close to what the USDA average is. And you see, kind of see this throughout, you know, we're pretty close. So we're within the same range. That's a nice quality check. And somebody might say, I bet all the values are right here. And you just have a few kind of crazy outliers here that make it look like the variation is big, but in actuality, the variation is really small. Well, we can test that by overlaying a histogram of the calcium in kale. So here we're just looking at the, the kind of the observations of kale. So here we see the peak observations are right up here um, around our mean. So that's good. But you can see our range of common values go all the way from here to here, right? Um, yeah, there's some extremes over here. There's some extremes over here, but you're just as likely to see a kale leaf here with, with calcium here as you are here when you look at this distribution. So, and this is still a 300 to 150. This is still a two to one variation in calcium with all of the outliers thrown out. Um, another point that's worth making about this histogram is it follows nicely along uh, what we call a bell curve or a normal distribution. So you'd expect often in natural systems, you would have this is the distribution of data. Most of it's bunched around the average. And then as you get farther away from the average, you get fewer observations. And this is just, again, it's a good kind of quality check internally to say, you know what, we're getting enough samples from a wide enough variety of places that we are getting a good representation of 
the actual variation of calcium in kale. So setting aside uh, um, kind of the statistical you know, issues here, another question might be for someone who's not a statistician, not a data nerd, the question might be, if I'm a consumer, how do I find these leaves, right? I wanna go find the healthiest kale leaves to eat. If I'm a producer, I'm thinking to myself, how do I produce this highest quality stuff? Because if I can produce this and I can prove to my customers that I can produce this, there's probably a real value there. And then a third question, again, we're not going to cover it today, but it's important to know, how can I predict it? Um, again, the teaser, August 19th, my colleague Greg will talk about that. But so right now, we've examined that there is variation. And I want to do a deep dive in where that variation comes from, because we have to answer that question about where variation comes from before we can figure out how a consumer can find that high quality kale leaf or how that producer can grow it. So we're gonna take that example of calcium and kale and we're gonna dig deeper, deeper, deeper into our data set to figure out what's causing it. So the first question I might ask is, is it, is it a climate factor, right? Is it just that in some climates, kale grows better? So this is a box plot of calcium content based on the climate regions. And you can see all the climate regions here. If you want to know what those climate regions are, here's the, here's the US, it's a NOAA uh, map of climate regions. And we can see, okay, this, this one right here, boy, it looks like they have really high quality um, calcium. But if we look at the number of observations, which are these numbers here, there's only two samples. So we can't really say that kale grown in the west, north, central part of the US, which is up here in the Dakotas and kind of the Rockies, grows really nice kale. We just know that we have a couple of, um, and then here you look at the Northeast, we can see the average, we can kind of see the range here by looking at the bars. There's a few observations are really high up here in the Northeast and the Southeast and the West. So all along here, all along here. So I don't think there's a huge geographic driver of quality. So what about soil type? So this is the same type of graph, except now we're looking at um, the basic soil suborder um, of each of these samples. And again, we see this kind of one little outlier. It's got two points. It looks high. It looks way above the rest, but there's only two. So we don't really have enough samples to say anything. So I'm not saying any, seeing anything here that says that soil suborder just that, that basic soil type is what's driving variability of calcium in kale. So what about genetics? What about variety? So here are all of the varieties that we received in the various BI labs with our kale samples in 2020. You can see here's a couple of varieties that look really good, right? Dwarf blue, dwarf curly. Again, two variety, two observations, two samples, three samples. Not enough to really say anything. The one that really jumps out at me when I look at this graph is this lacinato kale. Because it's really common in our data set, but when you look at the range, it goes everywhere from way up top here at the highest end to below average, right? So it's not that it's a high quality kale per se, it's that there is the potential to grow above average kale using this variety, but you're just as likely to be below average. So it's not variety that's necessarily driving the variation. It could be something else. So I wanted to look into management. So I started my investigation into management and I'm lucky because I have access to the full data set. I dug into our a raw spreadsheet, which has something like 4,000 rows and 1,000 columns is really big. And I just sorted kale, calcium and kale, and I just sorted from highest to lowest. And I said, I'm gonna manually inspect those top 10 kale leaves that had the highest calcium. And I'm gonna see if I can visually see any trends about what's going on. So, and, and what I found was two of those samples came from a store 
and one of those store samples was certified organic. One of those samples, two of those samples, sorry, came from a farmer's market. And again, one of them was certified organic. Six of those samples came from a farm. And when I started looking at farm management, I found some things that I found interesting. Five of those six, the kale was irrigated. Five of those six farms, of those you know, top 10 samples, six from farms, had no-till practices. Five of those six from the farm used organic amendments. So then we also have a couple that cover crops, a couple that were grown by farmers who self-identified as regenerative, and a couple who used foliar sprays. So I'm really curious, this irrigation, this no-till, is that a real effect or, or just coincidence? So the next step kind of down this journey of determining where this variation came from was to do some non-parametric analysis. And, and I'm not going to bore people with the statistical details, but um, what's really important that people recognize is, so I'm going to take, I'm going to use this table as an example. So I'm comparing heavy tillage, which we define as any tillage that was deeper than six inches, and I'm comparing it to no-till. So this red negative 28.56 means that there was a 28.5% reduction in calcium in kale in leaves under um, heavy tillage compared to the no-till samples we saw. And the darker this color, the more statistically significant. So this is a deep red. That means we have a high statistical confidence that this effect is real. If you look down here at this regenerative, this really light green. We don't really have much um, confidence in that. So I wouldn't really um, talk about that effect. So it looks like samples that we received that used heavy tillage as management had quite a bit lower uh, calcium content than the others. And then I compared different methods of no-till to tillage samples. So in this case, the reference is all samples that had tillage. And when we, when we compare it that way, we see that broad forking increased calcium content by 20%. Sheet mulching had 32% higher calcium. Solarization had, you know, 16% higher calcium. If you come over here, you know, you know irrigation, you're seeing an 8% increase. Um, you're seeing, a, you know, a small increase in biodynamic and certified organic. But then you're also seeing a reduction in things like local or no spray, or whatever. So there's, now I've got this manual kind of check that says, yeah, I think no-till and irrigation are affecting calcium content in kale. Now I've got this statistical um, kind of test as well to, to back up that theory. And the third thing I can do, and I think the thing that's most exciting is this investigation here, what's on the screen now, is something that anybody who's paying attention, who's on this call or who watches this video at some point in the future can do. Because this is just a screenshot from our Data Explorer tool. Um, we've, we've been building it. I believe Greg kind of demoed it a little bit at the last session. Um, I talked to Octavio, our developer, I don't know, an hour before the call, and we hope to you know, release this within the next week. Anybody can come in and use this tool to analyze any crop that we, that we have in our system and any of the nutrients that we analyze in our system. So I set my variables down here. I selected this to detail. I chose calcium. I chose the crop as kale. And now this top bar is all of the calcium observations in kale that we have in our system. And then I went down, if you can't see it here, because this is just a screenshot, but if you were to scroll down, there's filters that you can look for specific farm practices. So if I go down and I check irrigation, here's irrigation. So now I see the distribution of irrigation samples compared to the whole data set. And I see that my mean is shifted up. So yeah, we're seeing a positive effect of irrigation. So I've certified organic here. I don't have enough observations in this particular case to put a meet, to have a mean but it does look like it shifted up. This second to the lowest bar is tillage. And if I compare it, it's shifted slightly down from the average. And then this last bar at the bottom is no-till. And again, you can see there's a shift up in the observations compared to the, the full data set average and compared to the tillage average. 
And you can see, you know, how many observations we have for each of these sample types or each of these management types here, right? So I've got 37 um, observations of calcium and kale under no-till and 35 for tillage. So this is the, the framework that we've been building to really narrow down and do this investigation. But um, one thing that's really worth spending a few minutes on is talking about how we captured all of the data needed to do that little, that little deep dive that I just spent you know, five minutes doing. How do we have the climate region, the soil type, the variety, all of this management details so that we can ask these questions? And, and the, the short answer is our partners do it. So we work with an incredible set of volunteers from around the country. There's two types. The first type is citizen science partners. And, and, and these, these ladies and gentlemen are just volunteers who believe in what the, what the Bionutrient Institute is doing. They care about it. Um, and so they just, they wanna support us. So we provide them with supplies, they ship us samples, and then they take our um, Bionutrient app. And when they're collecting those samples, they collect important information about them. So if they're going to a store, you know, they're doing, they're, they're finding out, is it USD organic? Is it certified naturally grown? Is it hydroponic? Is it greenhouse grown? And they're providing that information to us. If they're going to a farmer's market or talking to a gardener or sending samples in from their own garden, uh, you know, they can do fill out a short questionnaire or do a short interview with a producer just to get some top level practices. Um, does the farmer use, you know, tillage or no-till? Um, is it irrigated? Uh, what type of amendments were used? Where was it grown? So it's a, the citizen science partners who are providing all of this information for us. And so the other type of partner are grower partners. So these are farmers that we interact with directly. Um, just like the citizen science partners, we provide them with sampling supplies, they ship us samples. I think the big difference is with our grower partners are, are one, they submit a lot more data, right? They're not just submitting a, a sample when they, uh, a, a survey, one short survey when they submit the sample, but they're actually doing it multiple times during the year. So when they plant that crop, that carrot or that kale or whatever, they're, they're going through a detailed survey and they're asking, you know, they're saying, hey, was this cover cropped? If it was cover cropped, what species were in the mix? Right. How did you prepare your land for planting? Right. Um, solarization, tillage, uh, you know, other no till practices. If it was tillage, what was the implement used? How many passes? How deep were you tilling? You know, very granular data. Um, you know, what amendments or fertilizers did you use? Then at harvest, they complete another survey. And this one is really more focused on, you know, what weed and pest control measures did you use throughout the year? You know, what kind of irrigation regime, if any, did you use? Um, again, any fertilizers or amendments that were added during the growing season, you know, and other harvest and yield data. And then at sample collection, when they're ready to pull that carrot and that soil sample out of the ground and ship it to us, they're collecting some infield observations about the slope. Is the soil sandy or clay? They're, you know, we're getting GPS coordinates. They're sending us crop varieties. And so they're doing, they're providing us all this information and to, and to try to provide some value back to, to the growers who are doing this. Obviously we send them results of all of the samples they send in. So that, yeah, the primary piece of value is they get a report of everything that we analyze in the lab. But the other piece is we provide all of these partners with a PharmOS subscription. So uh, PharmOS is an open source farm management software that allows farmers to view data in a way that's a lot more appropriate for them, right? So I don't wanna look at a spreadsheet about what I did. I wanna be able to, to pick a field on a map and, and get a chronological order of events. So all of that data that they submit at planting, at harvest, at the same time, they submit it to, to our platform so that we can ingest it into our data, database. We push it into their PharmOS account so they can see their data in the way that makes the most sense for them. So I, you know, right now I just wanna take a minute to say thank you to everybody who's been a citizen science partner or a grower partner over the last three years. Um, you guys are the engine that drive this project. So I just, you know, huge shout out to you and everybody who's participating in 2021. We really appreciate it. Um, the other piece to make all of this work is, is the framework, the technological framework that we're building. 
because in order to have all of those partners and manage that community, right, we have this huge community of hundreds of volunteers you saw on that map um, earlier, all of those dots, all of those volunteers who are sending all of this data, you know, all of this management data via the app, they're sending all of these, you know, crop samples to the lab. And that is all going into this, you know, massive public database that allows us to merge all the data and to, um, and to start visualizing it and analyzing it. Um, you know, each year since we started this, since our first lab year was 2018. So this is now we're going into our fourth lab year. You know, like every year we've been able to improve and automate the system. So it takes less man hours, right, to, to, to manage this entire, you know, library, this entire um, project. And so this year we're really excited. We're gonna be able to provide all of the, you know, the insights back to growers using this interactive data explorer I mentioned. And so people, so the growers can come in, look at their data and ask, how does my spinach compare to everybody else's? The consumer can come in and say, how does this practice or this label compare to this label? So um, we continue to work on this, this technology infrastructure. We've come a long ways. And um, yeah, so this is that component of building that public library that anybody can have access to and you know, all of our data is open source, except for, you know, personally identifiable information, a partner's name, email address, a GPS coordinate. So if there are people who are, you know, watching now who would love to be able to analyze this data themselves, like reach out to us. It's, you know, we're happy to share and, and work with a community. So that was um, kind of that, that those number one and number four that I mentioned earlier, right? is a variation in the food supply and building a public library. And so the other uh, topic that I wanted to spend some time talking about was trying to relate soil health and nutrient density outcomes to farm practices. Or you could call it the sources of variation that a grower can actually control, right? You can't control the climate, you can adapt to it, but you can't control it. Same thing with soil type, right? So, First, I wanna start with a question that I bet most people who are paying attention to this, uh, this webinar have asked, and is there a relationship between soil and nutrient density? And what we wanna look at in the data is, is there a way to provide quantifiable and statistical validation to, to this question, right? I think there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of opinions about you know, the answer to this question, but what can we provide within a quantitative framework? And so, to start having that conversation, um, we took our wheat and our oat data and we said, okay, we're going to strip away all of the other information about wheat and oats. And we're just going to take the soil carbon data that we generated in the lab, the respiration data that we generated in the lab, and the pH data. And we are going to try to predict the antioxidant content, polyphenol content, and protein content in wheat and oats using just that data. And they, these graphs are the result. So this blue line that you see, this is the, what we would call a one-to-one -one line. So if on the y-axis here, here are the predicted values. On the x-axis here is the actual values. So if we had perfect predictions, we would see that an, our actual value was 2000, and our predicted value was 2000, right? Our actual value would be 4,000, our predicted value would be 4,000. It would fall right on this line. Um, you look at these graphs and what you see is, these are pretty darn good, right? I mean, these points are really falling on these lines. Of course, there's noise. This is, you know, these are complex biological systems. So you're never gonna get it right on the line. Um, the only one that's maybe a little bit skewed is it looks like, you know, protein, in wheat is a little bit um, below that prediction line, as if we're, we would be under uh, under predicting. But these offer, you know, a strong suggestion that yes, there is a relationship between, you know, these soil parameters and nutrient density. Does that mean causation? I'm not going to say that right now, but there is a strong relationship. So the next step I wanted to do, and kind of similar to what I did with the, the calcium and kale um, example a few minutes ago, I want to focus on just one tillage practice and really kind of drill into it as an example of what we can learn from our data set 
and some of the things we are already learning. So I'm going to really focus on comparing no tillage to light and heavy tillage. So light tillage we define has any tillage activity where the deepest tillage pass was less than six inches. And heavy tillage is anything where um, at least one of the tillage passes exceeded, you know, either reached or exceeded six inches in depth. So the first question I wanted to, to ask to kind of examine these relationships between farm practice and soil health outcomes and then soil health outcomes and you know, nutrient density outcomes is how do these, some of these practices affect soil carbon and soil respiration? So these are both what you would call soil health indicators, but there's more indicators that you would want to measure if you wanted to have a complete kind of, uh, of set of of soil health indicators, things like you know physical things like infiltration or aggregate stability or other things, which we don't measure. But these are both good indicators of, of soil health. And so first, we're comparing no-till to, to these two tillage events. So no-till is zero, right? So whenever you see the line, this would be where no-till is because that's the reference. So we see in soil carbon, in, in grain systems, a 20% reduction in soil carbon. That's, that's, you know, significantly less carbon is observed in light and heavy tillage soils than no-till in these grain systems. Conversely, we see more respiration in these systems than we do in no-till. Now, my personal theory for this, and I'm not going to say I'm right, but my theory is that in grain systems, the primary source of any additional organic amendment or any organic carbon is really the residue. That's it, right? Generally don't get a lot of compost, not gonna get, you're not gonna get a couple inches of mulch like you might get in a kale crop. So when the only real source of, of carbon into the system is residue and you're tilling it under, you're taking that, you know, you're taking that residue, you're putting it in direct contact with your microbes, they're eating it up, so you're seeing a higher rate of respiration than you would in no-till, where the residue is remaining at the top. And what happens is they're respiring quickly. They eat up that residue. They, they exhale carbon dioxide, which is what we're measuring when we do a soil respiration test. So this is a system that you could argue is running hot, right? It's burning up that, that residue and it's pumping it CO2 into the atmosphere. And then we end up with less total carbon in the system than if we had a no-till system. So the next uh, thing I wanted to look at, and now this is just in wheat, is how does that same comparison, no-till versus light-till versus heavy-till affect nutrients that we're measuring in the lab. So right now I have a set, let's see, antioxidants, polyphenols, protein, and a whole set of minerals. What happens when I make that same comparison? Well, what we see is we're seeing a lot less antioxidants and a lot less protein and polyphenols and minerals in tillage systems than in no-till systems. Not only that, but in most cases, we're seeing that has tillage intensity increases. So going from this light tillage, this orange, to this heavy tillage blue, we're seeing a further loss or a further reduction in nutrient density. So there does seem to be a pretty strong relationship, at least in this wheat plot here, between the intensity of tillage and then the nutrient out density outcomes in crops. My question that I wanted to ask when I saw this data at first was, how well does this data translate over to some of the other crops we measure? What happens if we look at not the grain soils, but all of the, all of the, you know, the kale, the carrot, the potato, the, all the other produce samples that we're receiving from other partners around the U.S. So here we have these same graphs. Now we've added this data and now we see the trends have shifted. We're still seeing that heavy tillage reduces carbon in produce systems, but we're actually seeing that carbon is going up under light tillage. And one of the things that I think is happening is that in a lot of the small scale diversified operations that, that we're working with, with produce growers, 
growers are adding a lot of amendments, right? They're putting mulch down, they're putting compost down, other organic amendments. So you're no longer in a system where residue is the only source of organic material into the system. And so these farmers are able to add enough carbon through these amendments to offset what may be being lost through tillage. So you see a, a net benefit. Um, at, the, at the heavy tillage, you're probably seeing a couple things happen. One is you're actually, because the tillage is going deeper, you may be mixing more carbon deeper into the soil. So we're sampling down to eight inches. So we may be mixing up some of that carbon down to below that eight inch threshold. So we may be seeing an increase of carbon down below and a slight decrease up above. But then you also may just see that the amount of tillage, the, the, the increased intensity of the tillage is no longer um, the amount of residues or, or composts and organic amendments added is no longer sufficient to cover up the loss from all of the tillage. Um, and that kind of tracks here. If you look down here, I've got it buried at the bottom. The average grower partner that we worked with had 53 acres. And over 50% of the grower partners uh, in produce had less than five acres, right? So they had the ability and the scale to add a lot of amendments. Our average grain grower was over 3,100 acres, right? So they do not have the capacity to add a lot of organic materials back to the soil. It's just a scale issue, right? Um, and, and that theory I think is backed up by when you look at the respiration, now you're seeing that tillage in these produce systems is, re is reducing respiration instead of increasing it. And again, this may very well be caused by the fact that now all of the systems have plenty of carbon. So the, the soils aren't as, um, they're not as carbon limited or as food limited for the microbes. So that all the microbes have food to eat. So now the act of tillage and that disruption of microbial life cycles through the tillage is what's causing a reduction in, in respiration in the soil. So less biological activity because of disruption. Um, and I think so. this plot, I think, also kind of backs up that theory. Um, this is the average soil carbon content at zero to four inches based on the crops that the soil samples were associated with. So I did rank them from high to low, so it's easy to see. So if you look here, all these guys, mizuna, bok choy, spinach, kale, lettuce, Swiss chard, all of these have really high carbon content, right? Which suggests to me that they're being intensively managed. They're getting a lot of, um, they're getting a lot of amendments added to them. That carbon's getting built up. But if you look at the very bottom, here we go, wheat, potato, blueberry, oats. So these are systems that are generally over larger acres and they're less intensively managed. The end result being there's less carbon there. And then these two box plots kind of, again, just to illustrate the same point with our producer partners, look at all of these values where our soil carbon is above 10%, all kinds. So we see a lot of times, and we've talked to, to producer partners who basically say like, we ask the partners when they sample, you know, move the mulch aside and make sure you put that probe directly into mineral soil. They're like, I can't find my mineral soil. I've been, you know, I've been using mulches for so long that that, that line between mineral soil and mulch becomes really hard to find. Uh, and again, looking at scale, then when you look at the, the grain partners from the distribution of soil carbon and, you know, in different regions there, we see very few observations, even above 5% carbon all of this above 10%, and then there's just a few here above 5%. It's just, it is the, the scale of management that has a real impact. And, and I don't think that's gonna surprise anybody here that context matters, right? So when the soil carbon is already higher than normal, it's gonna be difficult to identify relationships directly between soil carbon and nutrient density, because adding a little bit more carbon in an already fairly saturated system, it's gonna make, you're gonna be hard to pick up any, any signal from that. And, and so we're seeking, especially in 2021, this has really been a target of our recruitment of partners. Um, we're looking for partners who have a wider range of soil conditions and kind of management histories. Um, 
you know, a lot of our recruitment has always been volunteer based, uh, people who are part of the Bionutrient Food Association or other kind of regenerative agriculture groups, they've already really thinking about Regen Ag. And so we tend to have people who are already practicing a, a lot of the things that people talk about um, on these types of sessions. And so we need to go out and find a, a better variety, a better spectrum of, of management so we can investigate these questions uh, more thoroughly. And one more kind of graph to, to, to bring that point home. I want to show that graph that I showed earlier where you had those really strong relationships. I do not think it's any coincidence that you see the strongest relationships in the crops that had the lowest carbon values, right? And in particular, oats had the lowest carbon values across everything. Oh, those 480 oat samples that we received, you know, the soil samples that came with it had the lowest carbon values. And oats also happens to have the nicest prediction graphs, the nicest very, you know, relationship between those soil properties and oats. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. So I've got one more topic that I want to talk about. Um, and then, you know, I'm hoping that we're going to have a, an engaging discussion. Um, I'll make one more point about the, the section I just covered before moving on. Just like that section at the beginning where you can go to that data explorer and you can investigate trends yourself, you'll be able to do the exact same thing with soil carbon, soil properties and management once that data explorer is, is released. So it's the same thing. I, I looked at one management practice really looking at tillage intensity. I just you know looked at a couple crops. Everyone here is gonna be able to do that with any crop they want to um, in any soil property that they think is interesting once that tool is released. So. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is directly linking farm practices to nutrient density outcomes. I'm going to start with this. This is, this is scary, right? There's, there's, there's red, there's green, there's NAs. What is going on here? Um, if we were to just try to look at every crop that we, that we get in the, in, the bio, in, a, in the Bionutrient Institute lab, 20 crops, and every you know, nutrient that we analyze is 18, we would have hundreds of rows like this, right? So this, these are different management practices. And here we go, this is just seven crops, beet, carrot, zucchini, pepper, potato, grape, tomato, just antioxidants and polyphenol. So it is a sliver of the data set that we have. And it is overwhelming to try to figure out how we can interpret anything meaningful from this data. Like you get a little bit of paralysis. You just, you don't know what to do. So we've been working, um, especially in 2020 and then continuing on in 2021 and trying to find ways to aggregate and improve our ability to interpret this data. How can we improve interpretability of this really complex data? So the first thing we've done is we've started to break crops down into crop types, right? Leafy greens has a crop type, grains uh, has a crop type, roots and tubers, fruits, um, vegetables. And then we can try to normalize across those crop types. And what I mean by normalize is I'm going to take the tomato with the highest antioxidant content. I'm going to take the pepper with the highest antioxidant content. I'm going to give them both a score of 100. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the lowest antioxidants in peppers and the lowest antioxidant in tomato. And I'm going to give them a score of zero and I can just rank everything in between. Now I can analyze both tomato and pepper together as part of a, a group and increase the number of observations that I have to try to simplify that analysis. So this is an example of in vegetables, so that would be zucchini, um, tomato, um, if I just say pepper, and there's probably one or two more I can't remember. And it's just looking at everything that we analyze. Here are the list of all the food nutrients that we're analyzing. And we're just looking at if it goes up, it's better than the reference, and that's positive. And if it goes down, it's less than the reference, right? So. Cover crops, okay, a little up, a little down. Here is um, greenhouse, a little up, a little down. Hydroponic, uh, a little bit more down. And, and I should mention here, similar to, to previous graphs I've shown, the, the, the more solid the color, 
the more statistical confidence we have in it. So if it's really, really transparent, we don't have a ton of statistical confidence in the values that we're showing. Um, but so irrigation, you know, locally grown, no spray across the board. It's like, okay, this is cleaner than that, than that table with all of the red and the green that I just showed, but it's still hard to interpret, right? If half the things go up and half the things go down, how do I have any idea what I would consider healthier? So the next step is to try to do one more level of aggregation. And we created something that we call the bio quality, bionutrient quality index. And the idea here is that we take a subset of the nutrients that we measure that meet a, a set of parameters. That is that more is generally, you know, more is better. They're generally lacking in, in the human diet and like there's not really a thing as too much right so some of some nutrients or some minerals you know you need it up to a certain point and then too much can cause toxicity so we don't want to you know include those so we settled on this this list of them so antioxidants polyphenols bricks calcium iron potassium magnesium sulfur zinc and we said okay we're gonna create this index so a single value and now i can show you this graph here this graph is management practices on the x-axis right so biodynamic certified organic greenhouse hydroponic and then i can aggregate all that data and see if i'm getting a positive response uh, an increase over the reference or a decrease so here greenhouse is is good cover crops are improving quality Hydroponic is decreasing quality. Um, organic, but not certified organic, but organic and regenerative in this case are reducing, are reducing quality. So this is just, um, it's a starting point to the conversation. It's a way of trying to, you know, simplify the interpretation of this complex data. We really want to reach out to the community and we really want to talk to people and say, okay, you know, food scientists, nutritionists, you know, other experts, help us you know, improve this, modify it, maybe throw it out completely and replace it with something else. But it's a starting point to the conversation. So we, we, we're starting to generate these plots for kind of each crop type. So this is vegetables. Um, here are the same plot types now for grains and leafy greens. So now we see no-till is like really good. And then almost across the board, every one of these kind of regenerative practices we're seeing a positive shift um, with us having more confidence in like the organic, the regenerative, the tillage. Um, over here, you know, leafy greens, we're seeing certified organic, we're seeing um, a, a decrease in BQI and a decrease, you know, in hydroponic, but um, some others are going up, but they're not, there's not a whole lot of statistical confidence in those. Um, and then the last set are like roots and tubers, for whatever reason, they're all all of the regenerative practices that we're looking at are supposedly causing a decrease. Um, we're over here, cover crops is, is going up, certified organic is, is going down. And um, again, I wanna make a couple notes or, or reiterate a couple things I said about those graphs. This is, the idea is to start the conversation about a definition of nutrient density. Um, we wanna reach out and engage with other experts. And also the primary goal of this is to identify trends. So we see a trend in the data, we like it, now we can go in and we can make, uh, we can do a deeper exploration of the data. And, you know, we're just now really starting to get to the point where we can think about asking very specific questions, building peer reviewed publications around those questions. So these are, you know, we want to spot trends that we can investigate. So I don't want anybody to, to, to say that the take home message of this is that, you know, that, that, that guy, Dan T, he said that certified organic fruit were, were not better than conventional fruit. Like that's, that's not what I'm trying to say, right? That's not the take home. Um, so just wanted to reiterate that. And I think one more thing before we turn it over to uh, discussion is I know a lot of people are interested and excited about the bionutrient meter. Um, I believe Dan will correct me in a minute if I get this wrong, but there will be an, an email going out soon that has this basic information in it and some more. But there's some, there's some good news and there's some bad news. Um, the good news is that all the meters are built, they're calibrated, they're, they're in boxes and they're ready to ship. And 
they're calibrated. We have calibrations for, you know, different nutrients in 10 crops. So you can see the list there, beet, bok choy, carrot, kale, lettuce, mustard greens, oats, Swiss chard, wheat, zucchini. So on that front, we're doing well. Um, the bad news is that software component, so that user interface, that user experience that allows, uh, you know, a novice user to pick up the device, use it simply and, and get a response that, you know, they're happy with. Um, we're not, we're not there yet. We're doing some work. So we are working hard to address those issues and, and we've adjusted our, our target date for to begin shipping the bionutrient meters uh, to August 1st. And so, so Dan, that is all I have. Hopefully there are some, some good questions that have come in um, and they're not all clarifying. Hopefully I didn't go too fast. I think you only went too fast when you were introducing yourself. Um, I don't know. I, I was at least able to follow yeah, that's normal. <laughs> the rest of it. You want to stop your screen share so that our faces look bigger on people's screens? Beautiful. There we go. Wonderful. Um, yeah, well, we've got a dozen questions uh, already and 40 minutes to um, to discuss. So I'll uh, I'll just start reading them out and and I guess we'll see who <laughs> who, who responds how. Uh, David Lazax asks, have you also looked at fungal communities in the soil and the effective tillage or other management practices on our muscular mycorrhizal fungi and the ability of those communities to act as an interface between soil nutrients and the plant? Right, so we haven't within the Bionutrient Institute lab. Um, part of the reason is we've been focused over the last few years on measurements that are, are relatively inexpensive and scalable so that we can get a lot of soil samples analyzed from, from, from a lot, you know, many parts of the country. And so those types of specific things looking at, you know, fungal uh, communities or bacterial communities are a bit harder to do in the, you know, in the framework of the lab as it is today. It would cost us about as much to do a, a microbial analysis of the soil as it costs us to do all the assessments on the crops and the two soil samples for each crop, right? I mean, so just it's a basically it's a it's a cost thing. We'd love to do microbiome assays. Um, we just simply haven't had the resources historically, as this has all been a very much you know charitably funded endeavor, and will likely continue to be <laughs> as well. So yeah, not yet, <clears throat> but hoping to. Um, Faith asks, what was the calcium PPM range in kale? So it, we didn't do it in PPM. We um, converted it into milligrams per 100 gram fresh weight. So that's consistent with how the, the USDA reports their values. And, and I'm trying to, I'm remembering, I think the range was from about 80 to 400. I thought it was 100 to 600, but something in that range. Yeah. Okay. Either way. And she says 1% equals 10,000 PPM. So to your point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the big thing to keep in mind is because we're doing fresh weight, we're taking into account the moisture content of, of the plant, where if you were doing like in the lab, we just do a dry ground sample and we get a PPM, but we have to go back and normalize for, for moisture content. Um, Stephen asks, uh, which findings were furthest from the USDA numbers and did any of those surprise you? Um, I don't know if I've really looked that closely at how far away we were in some cases. I'll, I'll be honest, I was looking at how close we were most of the time. <laughs> at this point, that was that was my uh, my concern was was kind of QA and QC. How are we doing? Are we in the same neighborhood? Um, but that is something that I do want to investigate further. And I know a lot of growers we work with are interested in knowing whether or not their values are above or below those USDA values. Yeah. And in many cases, we didn't probably have enough samples broadly enough from the ecosystem, but in many of them we did. So yeah, <clears throat> don't know. <laughs> Part of the point about the data explorer is that anybody who has these questions will have access to the data and be able to answer these questions themselves, right? I mean, that's part of the whole objective here is to facilitate not just people sending in samples as citizen science, but looking at the data and looking for patterns and sharing them with us and engaging in the conversation with it all. Yep, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, Faith, one more question. Uh, will the grower partner data sets from previous years be added to the analysis dashboard? Um, yes. It is on our list 
Um, not done yet, but it is on our list. Yes, we want to stop kind of viewing this, this, these data sets as we've done the last year is kind of like a year, each year is its own individual like self-contained bucket. And, and we're to the point now where we want everything to, to be merged together and just to continue to grow it. Which in you know many circumstances when someone publishes a report and says, we got this data from this year, they say, well, it could have been the climate. It could have been the weather that year. And so give us three years and then maybe it'll be more believable. So um, the fact that we already have three years complete and they're working on our fourth probably is, is um, just adds confidence to the data sets we're, you know, the, the statistics that we're finding. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Um, <clears throat> all right, Bill, a couple of questions here. Would, uh, would be interesting to also collect soil samples and test for biological activity, conductivity, organic matter, mineral content. I think maybe he posted that question before you talked about the fact that we do that. Um, because we do all those things except for conductivity. Right. Um, so yeah, we do that, Bill, but good point. Um, uh, when growers do the survey, are they asked to give the practices by crop? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they are, I mean, the way it usually works is they would um, they would reach out to Victoria Cox, who's our, our partner coordinator. And, you know, at the beginning of the season, you would they, you have a conversation, be like, what crops am I sending in? When am I sending them in? And then the idea is you're not just randomly sending in a beet sample, but you know, when you plant that beet sample, this is the one you want to send into the lab. And then you're filling in that management data specific to the beet that you're planning on sending into the lab. Okay, uh, Lenore has a question. Um, <clears throat> can you hypothesize explanations as to why the BQI was down with regenerative and biodynamic practices and up with greenhouse, which employs some of the best soil health practices? Besides that not enough growers to do no-till, which we're learning is the least disturbing so to soil microbiology. And then a follow-up, does the BFA work with other organizations analyzing soil health like Elaine Ingham's PEEPS? Um, Couple points there, but you, you, you go for it first. We'll see if we can unpack this one a little bit. Right. Yeah. No. I, I think the the, yeah, the the first question, the one about why you know you're seeing what is regenerative or biodynamic being down is is we don't have, especially for some crops like you maybe saw with fruits um, and leafy greens, we tend to have fewer observations. So we have smaller sample sizes, and we don't have as many like you know conventional or non regenerative practices to serve as a as a has that reference. So the way we do that analysis, we have to identify the reference and then we're comparing against it. Quite often that reference is something that we just don't know anything about. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it's grown, you know, not using regenerative practices. It just means this is the data we don't know about. Over here, we know this farmer grew it regeneratively. So a lot of it right now is identifying that wider range of growers, wider range of practices and better identifying kind of how they would bucket themselves regenerative and otherwise so we set the reference closer to what the average is that you're getting from a from a grocery store if you're buying like conventional produce yeah i mean well, as i would say a couple of things one is you know there's a difference between specific management practices like you know tillage below six inches or, or less than six inches or broad forking and a label like regenerative, which is self-proclaimed or biodynamic. And so I think what we saw, I mean, maybe I'm parsing this too, you know, too much, but when we looked at the specific management practices that one would consider to be regenerative, quote unquote, we did see improvements in nutrient levels and soil organic matter. When we looked at people who claimed by a label, we don't necessarily see that. So it's always been a really, you know, big point in when I make my presentations to say, just because someone is certified organic does not mean that they're producing crops of a higher quality. There are some certified organic crops which are of great quality and some which are quite poor. There are some local crops which are of great quality and some are quite poor. There's some off the shelf grocery store, quote unquote, conventional crops which are of great quality and some are quite poor. So I think, you know, the, the separation between the label and the specific technical practice is something that we're starting to find connections between. And I think it's part of this sort of paradigm shift where, you know, biological systems are not binary. You are not either 
alive or dead, you're somewhere in the middle. So you can't say I'm organic or not organic. I mean, it's just sort of, it's like a false, a false, um, it's a false structure. What we're finding is it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't pan out when it, we're looking at these things like nutrient levels. So, um, but to the other points you made as well, um, <clears throat> do we work with other organizations analyzing soil health like Elaine Ingham? Um, we are working with more and more people to, you know, analyze soil health and nutrient levels and, um, um, you know, animal feces for microbiota and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's a big project, everything we're trying to accomplish. I think maybe people can see the sophistication of the inter interrelationship of all this data. When we went and talked about um, <clears throat> these concepts with the USDA uh, four or five years ago and said, we think there's a connection between soil health and plant health and human health. They said, we do too, but it's too complicated. You can't figure it out. And I think even just this week, as we're beginning to have some of our partners share with people at the USDA, how we built this structure, they're saying, oh my God, this is amazing. We could use this to actually maybe find <laughs> answers to some of these questions. It's not too complicated. It just, it just takes a different way of looking at things. Um, and the sort of the way historically agronomic research has been done is a sort of a single factor, randomized replicated trial kind of a model. And you can find out certain things very well, but these more complex questions are much harder to tease out on a research plot here or a research plot there. You really have to have the broader spectrum of, of real lived environment. So anything else you wanna say on that um, point, Dan? Okay. Nope, nope, that's good. Lenora always has good questions. <laughs> um, okay, Sorvin asks, is it the case that when a leaf is particularly high in one nutrient that is also high in most other nutrients? So overall more nutrient dense, or is it often the case that one leaf is particularly high in X but low in Y? Another one high in Y but low in X. Ooh. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, that is a great question. And, and I wish I had like a graph or a figure to show to answer it. I don't. But um, I mean, so one of the next things on our list to do is really to start doing correlation in you know, analysis, correlation matrices between all of these uh, uh, minerals and nutrients to, to, to really get directly at that question. Are we seeing that potassium and calcium go up together? Are we seeing them go, you know, opposite directions? Um, you know, it's a huge question. Um, one thing I'll say is that that BQI index that I mentioned, another one of the kind of the values of that index is that it's just looking at a suite of things and it's saying, does the, the amount of this suite of things go up or down? So not, you know, there isn't like one individual nutrient in that that's pulling everything up or down, right? It's like we're averaging across all of these things to get a more, um, get a generalized sense of, of whether it's more nutrient dense or less instead of just, it's really high in calcium and low in everything else. And I would, I would add to that, I think, um, you know, what we have done so far, Dan showed at the beginning is look at about 15 different elements and a couple of compounds. As far as nutrients in crops, you know, antioxidants and polyphenols and um, protein and, and a bunch of different elements. Um, I, I think somebody recently did a study of garlic and found 10,000 compounds, different unique compounds in garlic. We've looked at two compounds or three. And so, um, you know, what we've done so far, I think we can safely say is identified variation in the things we've looked at and said, look, it's really quite significant. Um, but as far as having enough of the elements and compounds to look at in relationship to each other to say, this is generally better. This is generally worse. This goes up when that goes down. We don't, we don't have enough data yet. We haven't basically had the caliber of scientific instruments, like the really expensive ones where you can tease all these compounds out. So we haven't been able to, to, to take it to that next level. We are now this year, you know, getting access to those, those kinds of instruments. Um, so what I say is we've, we've, done the first level of defining variation, but we haven't really even started to define nutrient density yet. The BQI is sort of a, 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 a stand-in for how we would do this, how you would look at different orders and levels like amino acids in relation to enzymes, in relation to proteins, in relation to lipids, in relation to secondary metabolites, in relation to elements. When you look at all those things in relationship to each other, we think we're gonna find patterns that say, this is the spectrum of a much higher quality crop. This is a spectrum of a much lower quality crop. And if we can overlay those things on this 
management practice or this variety or whatever, then we should be able to do a much better job supporting growers and doing a better job. But we really aren't there yet. Um, we understand that's where we want to go. I would say we've completed proof of concept and now we're starting to be able to really do the job of defining nutrient density. So in process, um, anything else you would say Dan on that? Close enough. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> Vilti, uh, I guess this was during the presentation, is heavy tillage less often accompanied by amendments than light tillage because, as you said, the different me methods correlate with different farm types? Um, I, I don't know that it's less, um, I haven't looked specifically at like, what is the total quantity of amendment added at this tillage level versus that one? It is a, it is a investigation I would like to do. I will be honest, there's a hundred different investigations in this in this data set I would like to do, but usually don't find the time to do it. Um, I, I do think it is kind of what I said um, in the talk, which is it's more about whether or not you're burning off what you're adding um, at the same pace, if you're adding enough to replenish kind of what you're burning off with tillage and mixing in. And they absolutely are probably mixing some of that carbon down below the level at which we're sampling. So we may see results be a little bit different. If we were to go down another four inches, we might see that, you know, heavy tillage has, you know, quite a bit higher carbon than, than no tillage because we're, we're plowing it down there. So those, those would be the two that I would expect are causing that. All right. I'm seeing a bunch of questions here that all have to do with this. That I think we went through where you said, as I recollect, there were, four different types of crops. There were fruits, vegetable fruits like zucchini and tomatoes and um, I'm not sure, uh, cucumbers do we do? Um, peppers. Then there was grains, then there was leafy greens, then there were roots. Mm -hmm. And on the squash and the tomatoes, you know, regenerative looked bad and uh, greenhouse looked good. But when you went to grains, we didn't have greenhouse and regenerative looked good. And then when you went to greens, so I mean, if people recollect, we, you know, I see a bunch of questions here having to do this. What does the definition of regenerative, what about greenhouses? Um, you know, this is what we got. And what we found was depending on the type of crop, different things look like they're true. So that's enough to tell us that none of this is, <laughs> are we saying with confidence is true across the board. But um, I can read out some of these questions, but I think a lot of them pertain to that, to that section of the presentation. Um, Bill says, where regenerative practices reduce quality, how are the crops um, not standing in regenerative practice managed instead? And so one of the probably the primary sources of the reference or the non-regenerative is something from the grocery store that doesn't have a label on it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's poorly managed. It just means it doesn't have a label on it. And so that is, like I said earlier, okay, that's one of the problems when we're trying to develop these references is we have a farmer just simply checking a box to say, I'm using regenerative practices and therefore, you know, they end up over here. And then we get something from a store that this is just a carrot that is coming in. And maybe they're being selected for the only the nicest carrots get through and the rest get processed. I, you know, I don't know, right? So, but we end up in a situation where it's the lack of information is what creates the reference, which is not a perfect reference, which is why it's much more interesting when we have specific questions, you know, going back to like the no-till question versus light and heavy tillage, when we can ask a question, when we can have a lot more confidence in what the reference is. So when I'm asking that those light and heavy tillage, I know because I have in my my big spreadsheet somewhere it says no till. They checked the box. The the farmer said that. So I have much higher confidence that that is a no till sample, and I can compare my tillage against it. So we are going to be a lot more effective when we start drilling down when we can ask very targeted questions. So it's like okay, this person said they were regenerative and the greens kind of went down and that's kind of surprising. But if we were to take the next step and say, let's compare an actual practice versus another actual practice, when we have full confidence in how those crops are managed, then what are the, the, the findings? And I think that's one of the kind of the next steps that we need to do for the data analysis. And that's 
one of the places where, you know, you know, we've talked about getting maybe some help to like publish some of this work, other people who can look at all of this and help us come through it because there is so much there. But it's a really important point. A practice and a label are two different things. So if we can, if you, if you say you're regenerative, anybody can say they're regenerative and then that's what gets put into the database that doesn't necessarily correlate with minimal till or cover crops or anything else. All that correlates with is they said they were regenerative. So I think what's really interesting to say here is the people who said they were regenerative had nutrient levels that were below what came off the shelf in the store. And I like to sort of, you know, I mean, I grew up on an organic farm where I like to tell people we, you know, had a, you know, a uh, table at the local farmer's market. And I was taught to keep my nose just a little bit higher than everybody else's because we were organic. And, you know, it's just because you have a label does not mean your plants are healthier. Um, you know, and that's the reality of the, of, the, of the fact is that there are a lot of growers who are operating on a significant scale who do not have an organic or any kind of other label who are doing a really good job from a biological standpoint, managing the soil and getting nutrient levels into the food. And so, you know, I feel like I've been around long enough to see various, you know, um, isms, what Tash would call them in the food movement. And I think regenerative is one of the most recent ones. We had sustainable, we've had local and we've had, you know, whatever, um, permaculture and organic. And a lot of people jump on the bandwagon and say, I'm this, I'm this. Um, but, but when you actually get to the point of doing the work, um, you know, what we're trying to do here is see what really does the, what really affects and can we separate the labels that people sort of just jump onto the bandwagon with, with the actual real results. So um, for me, it's hopefully valuable in helping us maintain humility to say that the biodynamic samples that we got, even though they weren't necessarily enough of them, did not show up particularly well in relation to stuff off the shelf. Um, and I think that's just should hopefully help everyone stay humble um, instead of saying, oh, those conventional farmers, they're bad people, they do bad, bad things, um, we're better. I think that's just religiosity and you know that sort of tribal mentality, but I go off on rants sometimes, so I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Isabel asks, what did you define as regenerative? And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it was self-identified, Dan. Self-identified, yes. Yes. Um, uh, Samantha asks, I think it's effectively a similar question. It's odd you're getting highest nutrients in the greenhouse. I would have thought the microbial aspect would be a big contributor. Um, again, to the point about it was just fruits versus grains versus um, leaves, but you know, people who were growing in a greenhouse oftentimes are doing a much more attentive job to management than people who are doing, you know, if you've got tomato, hoop house tomatoes and outdoor tomatoes, people oftentimes put a lot more attention into their hoop house tomatoes, keeping them watered and things like that than they do the outside tomatoes. Um, but do you have any comments about that one? No, oh, you covered it. Cool. Um, all right, uh, Faith says, great presentation. Thank you for the rundown and asks, is the BQI Genesis clearly defined and published somewhere? Um, we laid it out in the 2019 um, annual report. So it's available at the, the RFC lab website. We haven't published it you know, beyond that yet. To date, it's been more of an internal index that we've used, like I said, to kind of identify trends and try to simplify complex information. Um, I think we'll have to decide as we move towards you know, peer reviewed papers, if it's something that we wanna, we wanna put out there, or if we're, we're happy just using it as a, as a conversation piece and, a, and a, you know, a starter to engage with food scientists and nutritionists going forward. Cool. Um, Liz asks, generally, do you find any difference in mineral values across the growing season? So do they always increase with maturity? Right. That is a great question, which is what people say when they don't have an answer. Yeah, that great question. Um, it, it, it's assemble for two minutes. <laughs> or just it's, say yeah. we, didn't, we didn't, we don't have that factored in yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the data to 
investigate that question is in the data set. The time to investigate it is, is difficult, but um, it's certainly something that we could we could look into. And it's again one of these really interesting questions that we would love to follow up on someday. Cool. Um, okay, Samantha's got another question here. If you're picking foods from a shop, you don't have the time from the paddock to test, which must must make nutrient loss a big factor. The things that we got off the shelf were effectively less fresh when they got to the lab than the things that came from the farm. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, and so I, I think most importantly, we have no idea how long something was on the shelf, right? We, we know when a partner picked it up off the shelf. We know when they put it in the mail to us. We know when it got there, but has it been sitting on the shelf for, for a week or a day? And especially that's not gonna affect minerals. Or how long you been picking and getting onto the shelf? Exactly. Or that as well. And, you know, that's not going to affect mineral content so much, but for, you know, things like antioxidants and polyphenols, those will degrade over time. And so that, that time can certainly have an impact. Yeah. I just to that point elements, like we said, minerals, calcium and copper and potassium and manganese and, you know, zinc and copper, those don't degrade over time. So when you pick the leaf of spinach or the tomato, the amount of iron that's in there is, going to be in there when you eat it. It's not like it sort of magically disappears. Some of the other compounds like antioxidants and polyphenols will break down over time between picking and when we get to the lab. So um, I think I could have wrong. No, you're absolutely correct. Okay. Yep. Wanted to emphasize, re-emphasize that. Great. Um, okay. So um, uh, Tom asks, it's interesting that elevated soil respiration microbial activity does not correlate with greater crop nutrient density. When microbes are burning the soil carbon house down, qualitative outcome is, is not necessarily optimum. It would be interesting to compare yield versus quality in this respect. What do you think about that question? No, I, I, th I think it is. It's an interesting point and, and I, I do want to investigate it more from kind of the this isn't probably the, the, the best way to say it, but almost from like a carbon saturation standpoint, right? Like some of these crops that have so much um, organic amendments added to them, there is so much carbon, so much food for the microorganisms available that I think just the looking at the level of biological activity is no longer has meaningful. Um, and it may be more about what are those microbial communities that are in the soil, you know, fungal versus bacterial versus whatever, where when you're carbon limited, like we saw kind of with the oats and the wheat, then just, you know, the fact that it's active, that those microbes are there, they have enough food to eat and they can be active, may be more of a benefit, right? So it's, it's you almost have, you have to bend the results and you can't just kind of make an assumption that all the way from 1% carbon up to 20% carbon that that respiration is continue to have a positive effect. You get a point where it's like, it just, it doesn't matter anymore. The difference between soil carbon and biological activity and <laughs> context. <laughs> yep, exactly. There's people who talk about, you know, no-till vegetables and they've got their one or two acre plots and they're dumping 30 tons of compost per acre down and they're calling themselves no-till, which is an entirely different situation than, you know, a 3000 acre grain farmer doing no-till, right? They're not putting down all that carbon. It's the only way it got into the soil was by being sequestered through the photosynthetic process. So biological activity is a, I mean, <laughs> there's a bunch of nuances there. And just to say, you know, I'm, I feel very proud of all the things that have been done so far. And most importantly, I think is the structure of the data whereby we can look at these things in relationship to themselves. And then we can say, okay, great. Now we have a structure where we can look at these things. Now let's say respiration is an entirely insufficient way to look at biological activity. There's much better ways of looking at biological activity. So how can we improve our data sets when it, in relation to that so that we have more context in relation to everything else. Um, just one point that's come across, you know, my sort of understanding recently, um, if you think about biological activity, you know, microbes in the soil, you know, in relationship to a living root um, and the speed of, you know, their life cycles and, and everything else, when you pull up a, a carrot and you pull the soil off the root of the carrot, there's gonna be a certain suite of 
of different families of microbes there, right? And different ratios of those families there. Now, when you put that soil into a bag and probably Ziploc it and put it in the mail for two days, say, the reality of who's there when the soil gets to the lab is probably going to be totally different than who was there when you put the soil into the bag. And then when you dry the soil and then you re-wet it, which is the process by which you discern um, respiration, you know, you're really not getting an actual assessment of who was there when the plant root was growing. So if you look broadly at the way that a lot of labs do work and a lot of scientists do work and people assess these things, what we're using is like what a lot of other people do. But that doesn't mean it's good enough or it's what we need to be able to actually answer these questions more deeply. Um, so and we've been, you know, in various conversations talking about, um, you know, a freeze dryer. So if you were to be able to take the soil when you pull the crop out of the ground and freeze dry it, basically you stop all biological activity, then you can take that soil and you can send it to a lab which can do a microbial assay of what you know DNA was there. And you can actually find out who were the communities that were present in relationship to that plant root. But anything shy of that, you're not really gonna be able to. And similar to that with the, when you harvest a crop versus when it comes onto the shelf, um, the only real way to see what's in the crop when you harvest it would be to do something like that, to flash freeze it, to you know basically make static. These are the compounds, these are the elements, they're not gonna be breaking down. Like you'd have to be doing it that way to really be able to get to the next level of discernment. So there's all kinds of levels and steps in this process, but it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like we're making progress for sure. Uh, anyway. Sorry, Dan, that was a bit of a ramble. Again, any other points or comments on that? Nope. All right. Um, uh, Hillary's uh, question from a while ago. I'm sorry, I haven't read it. Um, I'm working with a small urban farm. I'm encouraging them to do regenerative. Do you want samples when they are changing practices? Yes. <laughs> yes and yes. We'll make that three yeses. Um, and, and yeah, if you do want to volunteer, and that's for anybody who, who's um, here, and I think somebody else asked as well. Uh, Victoria, I think you're around. Could you drop your email in the chat? So Victoria Cox, like I said, who coordinates our partner program, um, she would be a great person to reach out to and get you set up on uh, uh, with a sampling plan and tell you more about our actual process. And for those who are not live, the website bionutrientinstitute.org, I think you go to the Get Involved tab, and then there's a Grower Partner button. So you can sign up there and, and get engaged as well. <clears throat> um, Lenore asks a similar question. So you need more volunteer growers that complete a survey about the specific growing practices, and also PR to reach out to those growers so that you have those baselines for the data to make more sense. Similarly, yes. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Samantha had asked, as an overall view, is carbon a leveler? I think we talked about when it's lower, yes. When it's higher, not so much. Right. Okay. Um, we're almost running out of questions. We're almost running out of time. This is great. Oh, they keep coming in. <laughs> uh, Liz, I agree with you, Dan, about labels, but I feel the nutrients in the conventional larger scale growers probably comes from foliar soluble feeding. And so is that accessible if we want to manage our land growing sustainably? Many thanks. Um, interesting point. I mean, the question is really which nutrients, the, the, the soluble feeding is really hydroponics. That's the epitome of soluble feeding. Um, but when you start to look at plant secondary metabolites and amino acids and lipids and all kinds of other things, um, the plants are not usually fed those compounds. Those are compounds that are built through a active microbial process. So as we um, deepen our list of compounds being assessed, I think we can more and more confidently say that you know, for a crop to be able to produce them, they would have to have had a, a well-functioning biological system and probably have been relatively healthy and probably have been you know, functionally improving the health of the soil. Um, Dan? 
Nothing to add. Nothing to add. Nailed Again. It. <laughs> I'm getting the impression you're just being polite. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll stop answering questions. Um, uh, Samantha at said, I had an agronomist say that you can easily get too much carbon to get good growth. How relevant is this in your studies? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about too much carbon to get good growth. Uh, I, like I think I mentioned in my talk, we can get too much carbon to uh, adequately investigate the role of carbon um, to nutrient density outcomes. And I think that's something we've definitely seen with, with specialty crops that that's, that's hindered our ability to, to learn more. Yeah. Or you get enough carbon that it doesn't really seem to be the limiting factor anymore. Right. Um, I do tell people some who, you know, are maybe buying a, a compost based potting soil and putting it into a box with, you know, and calling it a, a raised bed that, you know, there's probably a lot of organic matter in that, but there may not be a lot of minerals in that because it doesn't, it's not soil, it's just compost. So in that circumstance, I would say it's entirely possible to have too much carbon, but that would only come from not having a soil that was built through living processes, um, I would say. Um, <clears throat> Samantha says, I attended a conference in New York City where the high-end grower supplying top restaurants had in-field refrigerators um, and found that the best taste was found by slowly cooling, not, not snap freezing. I wasn't proposing the snap freezing would be for taste. I was proposing that would be for um, uh, empirical assessment of what was present at point of harvest. Yeah, I think flash freezing would destroy the <laughs> experience of eating most things. <laughs> all the all the water is removed in the process, so it's it's just a yeah, it's a it's not it's not it's not that food anymore when you get to that point. Um, but the fridge in the field would slow down the enzymatic processes, which would keep the plants from breaking down. It would slow the process of breaking down, so the flavors would be more kept you know, from harvest to consumption. I think that would, that argument would make sense. Um, Lisa asks, how reliable is BRICS in assessing BQI? So actually we've included BRICS has a component uh, of BQI. So um, I don't think we've specifically tested it against BQI to see if there's a relationship, but instead we, we recognize that it is an important um, um, indicator of things like, you know, sugars and, and other solubles within the, in the crops. So we've included it. Have you tested BQI against bricks and seen if it can predict? Well, we couldn't test it because it's, it's in it. So right. we would have to remove bricks from BQI first and, and then do a comparison. It's, it's, again, it's something that would be interesting to do, um, but hasn't been done yet. Cool. All right. Um, Matt, um, apparently someone had already asked his question. Um, did we notice any relationship between high levels of calcium and other minerals and high levels of antioxidants and polyphenols? Any connections between secondary metabolites and minerals that were found? Yeah, and we haven't done a, a good, like I said, kind of correlation matrix or, or analysis of this data yet. And it's something that it's on our list to do. We'll do shortly. So Hopefully we can update this at some point or, um, you know, share that out when we have more details. Great. Um, all right. Well, that was a number of questions that we rapidly moved through here. Um, we've got a, just a couple minutes left. Um, uh, Lisa, this is a softball here. How can we support or help fund this work? <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> um, yeah, the I mean, BioNutrientInstitute.org uh, was recently launched and is the new home for um, all this work that uh, we've all been doing together. Um, previously, we were calling it Real Food Campaign. So, um, if you're wondering what the difference is, uh, really, we're just trying to raise the bar on the scientific um, um, veracity and, and functionality. Not that it was low before, but just to really focus on we're actually doing something quite significant here. So there is a donate uh, page there, uh, certainly. Um, there are also ways to get engaged, uh, be a grower partner, be a you know organizational partner. Um, 
the BFA website is um, being redone and hopefully will be uh, refreshed for the first time in 10 years um, at the beginning of next month. Um, we certainly have a donate page there as well. Um, but yeah, if, if people are interested in engaging, um, you can you can reach out to us uh, at through both sites, um, depending on what your skill sets are, your passions, your relationships. Um, it is an ecosystem, so um, you know we all have our our roles in it. But only through that symbiosis do we expect to be, or as successful as our symbiosis is, we should expect to be successful. So it's about all of us together engaging. Um, all right. Um, okay. A uh, few thank yous there, Dan. Do you have any final, final words? Um, not really. I just you know let everybody know. I, I know there's a question that just popped up in the Q and A. Um, it's not that the data is not usable yet. It's you know we've generated a ton. It takes time to work through all this stuff. So you know we we hope to consistently provide updates. Um, provide more sharing and, and learning about the data sets and, you know, would love to, to collaborate with and interact with people who want to help us do that um, would really help us move the process forward um, more quickly. There's, there's plenty of great questions that have been asked during this session and just limited time to answer them. Uh, well, yes, and many more we don't have answers for, but we hope everyone will help us in the process of answering them. Yeah. I'm 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 tempted to answer this question from Dara about so this data isn't usable yet as it shows regenerative is it is bad for riot crops I'm just I'm like I, mean, I guess I guess that was maybe a typo um, to my point previously all we know about the things that were labeled regenerative is that the person who sent in the sample said they were regenerative and so what we can say is the people who said they were regenerative on average showed they were doing a job below <laughs> below the average. Um, what we did find was that growers that were doing no till were doing a better job than growers that were doing till. So there's the label regenerative and then there's the regenerative practices which are also organic practices and maybe permaculture practices and agroecology practices and agroforestry practices and and you know, they aren't just regenerative practices, but they are, you know, claimed by the regenerative community. So when we look at those practices, we do see positive impacts. When we look at people who claim the label, we do not see positive impacts. So I just want to try to just reinforce that point again. There's a massive difference between the actual scientific facts and details and a lot of the buzz and the bandwagon effect and the claims. So what we're really trying to do here is parse that out um, and, and provide some, you know, some data around which to have the conversation. One of the biggest issues I would say with the regenerative movement as it stands right now is that more and more companies are jumping on the bandwagon to claim regenerative. Pepsi and you know, Unilever and whoever all else are you know, gonna be coming out in the near future with regenerative labels. And they can because there is no definition of regenerative. So basically what that means is anybody can claim it and there's no way to say that you're not because there's no definition of what it is. So um, what we're hoping to do with this nutrient density conversation is to ground it in that kind of solid science so that whenever anybody does want to put out a label, which we hope is not just nutrient dense, but at the 60th percentile of the BQI or the 20th percentile of BQI, that's a trusted label, which is based in science um, that's really how we're trying to engage this conversation. So um, important point, it does require stopping and thinking for a second. Um, hopefully I conveyed it relatively well. Um, but thank you, Dan, for everything you've been doing for so many years. You've been stalwarts behind the scenes, keeping a low profile, but hopefully people got a chance to appreciate you today. So thank you very much. <laughs>